So now after this talking about this carbohydrate and protein, let's talk a little bit about nucleic acid. So we all know this nucleic acid, somehow it's connected through this kind of double helical bundle. Okay. And what we know that this kind of binding generally can be found in DNA. And then the DNA is storing our information, which actually opens up during the uh, information passing phenomena, transcription and translation and all those things. It transfers its information to mRNA, which also uh, having some chirality. And this mRNA actually interacts with the ribosome and that actually creates the protein molecules that we actually require. So this whole process, how the DNA interacts with RNA, it interacts with the ribosome and over there, how the protein molecules are actually synthesized. This full system is known as the central dogma of biology. So that is how the information is passed on. Now think about that because we are chemists, we are not biologists, so we want to understand like, wait a while, how it is actually happening there. So is the DNA going to open up and interact with the mRNA all the time or it opens up at particular certain conditions? The answer is it opens up only at a particular condition. Just wait a minute. Okay, sorry about the background noise. So, so this DNA molecule actually senses some changes in the environment of the biology and only when it actually opens up. So those kind of phenomena which actually aids to the opening of the DNA, sometimes they're in generally known as the transcription factors. And what are those transcription factors? They can be physical conditions like temperature. Like someone actually having some wrong metabolism, the body is heating up, it actually sensed by the DNA and they actually try to stop it by creating some protein molecules which might going to help you out. It might be pH, it might be the oxygen concentration, it might be the carbon dioxide concentration and so on and so forth. So this can be physical in nature and they can be chemical in nature. pH, I would say it is probably chemical in nature because it is actually nothing but sensing the proton concentration of the solution because all our, for example, cellular system is generally tried to be near neutral condition, 6.5 to 7.5. But sometimes if the cell is having some malfunctionality, for an example, cancerous cells. They actually become very much acidic in nature. It can go even close to three or four. So at that time, the biology senses this and try to respond to it. So how this biological response happen? The DNA somehow detects it or other cofactors somehow detects it. And that detection is also coming through molecular recognition. So that means this transcription factor, how it is interacting with this DNA, it is actually nothing but a molecular recognition in certain cases. And over here, again, the chiral nature of the DNA and chiral nature of that particular chemical can be very crucial for ensuring that we are actually responding to the correct call, not any false alarms. So that is why the molecular recognition, even the DNA and RNA very important. And additionally, what is recently has been found, the DNA and RNA are not only acting as the simple gene information transfer agents, they can also act as an enzyme. So for an example, there are certain numbers of systems known as RNA enzymes, or sometimes it is also known as ribozymes. So you can take a look into that. 
So these are very crucial and they actually play a huge role during the gene splicing. So sometimes the genes has to be restored, has to be modified during the evolution and whatever the things happening with the gene. Uh, gene and its structure and its uh, conservation or its modification, even some of the RNAs are playing a huge role on controlling like which particular portion of the DNA or RNA I have to cut it down, which particular group I have to look into. Even over there, it is going through a molecular recognition. And again, the chiral nature of the RNA molecules is a very important factor. So recently it is found it is not only the RNA, but the DNAs even, which is known as a very robust material. It's found that DNA can also even participate in catalysis or some chemical reaction in certain cases. So those are also known as DNA zymes. So what they do, they sometimes also do the similar work like the cleave or uh, functionalize. For example, you need to put a phosphate group in one particular portion so that it can recognize a particular molecule as a transcription factor. So for that, you have to functionalize the DNA or RNA segment with a phosphate group. And this DNA zymes does this reaction through an acid-base reaction. So this kind of, and cleave a particular DNA at a certain place so that it can respond to a particular condition. So those kind of things, and even sometimes repairing of the DNAs or RNAs. So those kind of things are happening over there. And again, for these particular interactions, you have to do that at particular certain conditions. You cannot miss even by a one base pair. And during that, how the molecules are certain that this is the thing I have to follow. The DNA and RNA not only use their own chirality, but also the change of the chirality on the backbone of the nucleic acid they are actually reacting on. And both this chirality plays a huge role to find out exactly what is happening and how it can be controlled. So that is why molecular recognition is a huge important factor. And biology interacts through the molecular recognition. So it is not only the protein, not only the carbohydrate, even the RNAs and DNAs have a huge role to play. And now you look into that one step back and take a look into that. We have protein in biology. We have carbohydrate in biology. We have DNAs and RNAs in biology and all of them use chirality as one of their very important tool to do the molecular recognition. And this molecular recognition is very important not only for their metabolism, but also you can say that is how the biology is interacting with the surrounding atmosphere. Right. So biology, we found it is having a chiral environment. So now, as Rishabh has earlier told us today, that if you do a reaction with a chiral environment, because biology it is doing its reaction with an enzyme, carbohydrate, protein, DNA, RNA, that environment is chiral. And if it does a reaction over there, you are going to see a difference of their chiral preference. You are actually going to see it in an enantiomeric excess. So in biology, if you throw a set of enantiomers in the same uh, concentration or same equivalent, if the biology interacts with them, they are not going to interact with the same, with the same rate, with the same uh, uh, extent of the reaction. That will be different. And at the end, you will say one enantiomer is reacting more than the other. So you are going to create enantiomeric excess. So that means it is not only that I have to create synthetically 
a chiral environment. But if I allow the biology to interact with something, I am expected to see some enantiomeric excess. Everybody agrees to this particular point or not? If anybody has any question, please let me know because this is a very crucial point. That biology is chiral and that is why when it's going to interact with a set of chiral molecules, it is going to distinguish between them. It is going to create an enantiomeric excess. So with that thing in mind, we are going to go to the next system. And this particular system that the biology can detect chirality and uses chirality and can invoke enantiomeric excess, keep that thought in mind. We'll come back to this point just before we conclude today's class. Now, with all those things in mind, I am going to define only the amino acids today. The carbohydrates and RNAs and DNAs we will discuss uh, later parts. Carbohydrate probably we are not going to discuss. DNA and RNA we are going to discuss a little bit later point. So amino acids, all the natural amino acids, which is also you can say it's an alpha amino acids, because over here you have a carbon, you have a carboxylic acid, you have a R group, you have an amine group, and you have an hydrogen. So these are the common structure of all the alpha amino acids found in the biology naturally. So over here, first we'll try to understand this alpha amino acids we found, how we can find out whether it is a L amino acid or a D amino acid. So this is alpha Greek term and this is capital L. How to differentiate that? So for that, you have to just remember the simple rule called corn. So what is corn rule? So over here, what you have to do is simply put the carbon, draw its integral geometry, put the hydrogen on the back. That is the first thing. Hydrogen on the back. That means it should take the, the backmost position, the wage bond. Then put the groups, carboxylic acid group, R group, NH2 group. And then follow the corn. The corn stand for carboxylic acid, then R, then the amine group. Just find out exactly how these groups are oriented and put it one, two, three. So over here, this is one, this is two, this is three. Hydrogen on the back and then orient carboxylic acid, R group and NH2 group as one, two, three. This is not exactly the CIP rule. This is a rule defined much earlier than the CIP rule. So it's a little bit uh, qualitative in nature. And over there, this carboxylic acid COR in group, you just find out and see how they're connected. So put one, two, three, and see how they're connected. So over there, you can see they're connected anticlockwise. So if they're connected anticlockwise, that will be an L amino acid. And the same system, say carboxylic acid, hydrogen, and now say I exchange the R with the NH2. So now find the corn, carboxylic acid at the top, R over here, three over here. So now connect, they're in the clockwise. If it is clockwise, it is going to be a D amino acid. Okay, so that is you figure it out, L amino acid and D amino acid. So in the exam, if I ask you the question, like draw this L amino acid, if I ask you to draw the structure, you have to ensure that you have drawn that in the particular orientation because this L and D 
is actually showing their spatial orientation, specific spatial or three-dimensional orientation, and it has to be correct. It has to follow this simple corn rule. Put the hydrogen on the back, carboxylic R and NH2 group, such a way that they can be connected in the anti-clockwise, then it is L. If it is connected in the clockwise, it is D. Fine. Now, most of the amino acid found in biology, majority of them are L amino acids. So very rarely you see or you counter a D amino acid. We'll come into that later when the D amino acid can be found. So it is mostly found in L amino acid. And the D and L amino acid can be interconvert among themselves. We'll come into that later, typically via hydrolysis. Okay, so now what we are going to cover, there are 20 naturally occurring amino acid. So I'm going to draw the structure, general structure of it. I'll put out their name and how they actually expressed with three letter and one letter code, because this will be important in the later part of the class. So over there, I'm going to say this is particular, this particular code. That means you have to understand which particular amino acid I'm talking about. So for that, what I'm going to do over here is the following. I am going to draw the structure, general structure of the L amino acid. So the rest of the thing will be same. What will be the changing thing will be the R group. So over there, I am going to write the structure of the R group, the name of the amino acid, the three letter code, and the one letter code. So they are actually explained in either of the way. So the first set of the system I'm going to talk about are known as the aliphatic amino acid. That means the R group is typically an aliphatic group. So the first example of that is when R is equal to nothing but a hydrogen. So now you can imagine if I put a hydrogen in the place of R, that is not going to be a chiral molecule anymore because it is going to have a sigma plane going through that carboxylic acid group carbon and NH2 plane. So that is the only achiral amino acid. And the name of this amino acid is glycine. Three letter word gly, one letter word G. So that means if I want to give you an example, like this will be a protein group and over there, this is a G, G, G chain. That means you have to understand, I am saying there will be glycine, glycine, glycine connected to it. Okay. The second one is the next one you can think about, put a methyl group over there in the place of R, the rest of them are same. This is known as alanine. Three letter code ALA, one letter code A. The next one comes an isopropyl. The name of this is valine. Three letter word VAL, one letter word V. Then the chain actually extends a bit. An extra CH2 group added over here. This is known as leucine. Three letter word LEU, one letter word L. And then there is a another amino acid, which is nothing but very similar to the structure, but an isomer of that. So what happens over there? One of the CH3 ships over here and then it is CH2, CH3. So you can say one of the CH3 over here ships down, and this is isomer, so it is known as isoleucine. So in the name, it is saying that it is isomer of leucine. Three letter word, I-L-E, one letter word, I. So these are the five different amino acids can be found in biology, which is having simple aliphatic groups in its uh, structure as an R group. Next, again, I'm just drawing the group I'm drawing.
and over here I'm mostly following this R group. So again, I'm going to write the name over here. So the structure over here first, then the name of the amino acid, the three letter code and the one letter code. So after aliphatic, we look into aromatic groups. That means there is an aromatic group present over there. The simple one we found, it is a CH2 and then a phenyl group because putting a phenyl group very close to will be a little bit tricky. So biology finds out that let's put a CH2 spacer in between them. And you can say that this is nothing but an alanine derivative where alanine was CH3, but instead of one hydrogen, I'm putting a phenyl group. So that is why the name comes phenyl alanine. Three letter word PHE, one letter word F. Because it pronounced with like F pronunciation, F phonetics. Why it is not P, it'll come into that just when we'll be completing this part. Then comes this particular CH2 group. Then this particular heterodiabetic system, which is nothing but an indole group present over here. And the name of this is tryptophan. Three letter word TRP, one letter word W. Again, why not T? We'll come into that in very soon. And the next one is come a phenol group. The name of this is tyrosine. Three letter word T O I R, one letter word Y. So these are the three different aromatic compounds we can have over here. Then comes some of the polar systems. So one of the beginning ones comes CH2OH. So these are the structure of this R group over here I'm drawing. CH2OH, if alcohol group, the name is serine. Three letter word ACR, one letter code S. Then comes a variation of it, where it forms a secondary alcohol. First it was a primary alcohol, then it's a secondary alcohol, which group comes a little bit closer. The name of that is 309, three letter word THR, and that is where the one letter word T was used. So that is why tryptophan or tyrosine doesn't get uh, their one letter code with T, they have to be happy with Y and W respectively. So these are the two different polar groups we can have. And additionally, we can have two other compounds which are can be the amide bonds. CH2. And then an amide bond. And this name is asparagine. Three letter code ASN, one letter code N. And then there will be another variation of it. Where instead of one carbon, there are two carbon in between. And then we have the amide bond. And the name of the system is glutamine. And the three letter code is GLN, one letter code is Q. So with this, we complete the aromatic and polar set of the molecules. Then we actually move towards the acidic set of the molecule. And over here, again, I should draw the structure. So 
So in the acidic group is nothing but the same amide bonds we have drawn earlier, their acidic group. Instead of amide, put an acid group, and that will be the systems I'm going to have. So it will be CH2C double OH, which is known as aspartic acid. Acetylated from ASP, and its carboxylate form is known as aspartate. One letter code D because A is already been taken. And then this extra C is to connecting between them. This is known as the glutamic acid or known as the glutamate in its decarboxylated form. Three letter with GLU, one letter word E. So these are the two different acidic groups you can have. Then comes the basic groups. Over there, you can have very interesting structures. Four CH2 chains, and then a primary amine group. There's a long chain, and then you're having a primary amine. This is known as lysine. Three letter word, L-Y-S, and one letter code K. And then you can have another one from the same basic group. It is known as arginine, where you have the three CH2 groups, and then you have over here a guanidine group over here. And this particular set is known as arginine. Three letter word ARG, one letter word R. And then the another one we have in the basic format, which you can also consider in the aromatic format, but you put it in the basic format because it mostly plays its role in the basic system, where you have a imidazole group over here. So this is nothing but a uh, imidazole group. The name of the system is actually histidine, then acid, HIS, and H. So these are all the acidic and basic groups falls into the natural amino acids. And we have only a few of them left. We are going to draw the structure in three letter, one letter. So for that, we are going to have other two molecules, which are actually having, we put it in as a special group, but you can also consider it in the polar group, which actually has thiol groups present, CH2SH. The name of the system is cysteine, three letter was CYS, one letter word C. And then you can have another version of thiol, but not exactly thiol, but a thiol ether. And this is known as methionine. Three letter word MET, one letter word M. And then there's another version, which is very rarely found, but it is having very important factor present in the terms of enzymatic activity is a selenium version of the cysteine. Instead of sulfur, you have a selenium, and the name is selenocysteine. Three-letter word ACC, one-letter word U. And with all of them, considering almost all of them, and one important amino acid, which is very important and a little bit different structure present is this one where it is actually a secondary amine completes the circle because it is more like a complete the circle complete make a cycle out of it so it is a two degree amine present instead of one degree amine commonly present and the name of this amino acid is proline 
three letter word PRO, one letter word P. And this is very important to develop the turns into the protein structure because generally amino acids when they form, they form in a linear fashion. But if you want to create a turn, you put proline over there and due to the background, uh, the back, uh, the structure of this proline backbone, you automatically create a turn. So that is why creating a turn in the protein structure, especially say on these regions, so prolines are actually been used over there. So these are the different amino acid structures. So today we learn mostly about the molecular recognition, how it is important. And we found that biology use molecular recognition a lot, and they use chirality as one of their tool. And we also know about the different amino acid structures. Those will be very much important for your exams and assignments. So with that, we'll stop over here. The next class will start up from there, and then we'll find out some interesting facts that how the biology interacting with this chirality can affect and can be used even as a sign of life in, layer, in the real world. So that we will discuss later. So we'll stop it over here. If anybody has any question, please go ahead. And I'm stopped recording.